Well, officially, good morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure here to be back with you all. Uh, thanks be to God, we can be here for another day. We're going to be continuing looking at the everlasting covenant, that phrase in our Bibles. I want to do a recap from last week because I kind of had to rush at the end because I didn't realize how much material I had, uh, or rather God had, and I was trying to expound upon it. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to begin there. And I'll cite some of the things that we've been over, and I'd like to talk still about the concept of the everlasting covenant with the idea of hopefully finishing up that today. I'll just leave that slight back door available in case I need it. And then uh, next week, perhaps, we'll talk about God's timeline and uh, probably use the projector, just before I forget that, next week. Yeah. Because um, I like pictures. And I can tell you this will happen and this will happen and this will happen, but it's a lot easier with a picture. So hopefully that will be coming up next week. Now then, let's open ourselves, our time together in a word of prayer. Our Father God, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for all of your grace and love through Jesus Christ that you shed upon us abundantly. I'm thankful, Lord, that we have everlasting life by trusting what you have done through Jesus Christ. Thankful for your blood that paid for the sin of the world. Thankful that you've reconciled the world to yourself through that act. And that all that trust you, simple faith, can have everlasting life and all the spiritual blessings that come with it. Lord, I ask every day, and I sincerely mean it, please fill us with your wisdom, what we ought to learn this day to continue maturing in the faith, and that we can continue to represent you as your ambassadors, uh, sharing that message of reconciliation whatever way we may, until that glorious day that you call us home. Uh, may all honor and glory be to you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so last time the, uh, we covered the last phrase, uh, bookly speaking. I, I still can't figure out the term for that, but uh, going from cover to cover, the last time that uh, the term everlasting covenant appears in our Bibles is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. So I'll begin right there, verses 20 and 21. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I spared a lot of context in this one in particular, because if we recall, I won't go, well, I'll briefly talk about them all, I suppose. There were 18 times in our Bibles that we encountered the phrase everlasting covenant, and if you're like me, that sparked interest inside of my brain, thinking, what is going to last forever that God has told us about? <clears throat> First time was the rainbow covenant, if you don't mind me using that phrase, with Noah. Some call it the Noah Hick covenant. I have a hard time saying it, so that's why I don't say it. But uh, it's the promise of God that he will never destroy this earth again with water. Hey, we're more than enough hints saying fire is coming. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's for another time, I suppose. But he's going to make all things new. We know that that's coming. That everlasting covenant was made with Noah and his family and every living creature on the earth. It was made for everything. Okay. Other than that, every time we have looked at the phrase everlasting covenant, it has been made with Israel, or perhaps, you know, the one that would become Israel, because the next three times you encounter it is Genesis 17, where uh, God covenants with Abraham for the land, and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. All right. And so we see the everlasting covenant three times, given to Abraham uh, in that chapter. Next was a bit of an oddball in Leviticus 24, verse 8, where it's talking about the showbread. So the showbread is going to be an everlasting covenant with the priesthood, obviously it has to be, uh, that they would present that bread uh, as, uh, well, forever, I guess. And then I only briefly talked about the bread that these were gigantic loaves 
Now I forget the amount. I actually deleted it off of here to save some space, but um, they were really big, put it that way. Several pounds of, uh, of bread in one loaf. Next, uh, were a couple in Numbers. One of them had to do with Phineas, saying that his descendants would, would have a place in the priesthood. He was a descendant of Aaron, right? And because of his zeal for God's righteousness, uh, which might be a little awkward for us to think about, that's when he took the javelin and, and stuck through a Israel and a, a Midianitish woman, something like that. But they're committing idolatry, fornication, right in front of the nation of Israel that was at the tabernacle uh, in sorrow, praying to God for the plague that was uh, beset upon Israel for their disobedience to God's law. So he did that, and God made that promise with him. Uh, but then all of these other ones, so 2 Samuel 23, <clears throat> verse 5, makes mention of the Davidic covenant, which can give you can get more information in 2 Samuel 7 about what that is. Essentially, God is saying that, there, that his throne... David's throne and his kingdom would be established forever, a indicating futuristic, of course, that Jesus Christ would sit on that throne ruling and reigning uh, as he should, is, as Israel's rightful king. First Chronicles 16, 17 is the next time we see that. It is an exact copy of the tenth occurrence of the everlasting covenant in Psalm 105. Uh, it's David writing a psalm speaking of that same everlasting covenant that God made with, him, with himself, with David. Isaiah 24, verse 5, Isaiah 55, verse 3, Isaiah 61, verse 8. These are the next occurrences of that phrase, everlasting covenant, uh, all of which are pretty much the same, speaking of that which will be done with Israel. Isaiah 61 uh, is a little extra interesting to me because Jesus quotes that one in Luke 4. That's where he is in, I think he's in Nazareth, actually, and he's given... A scroll, and it's a scroll of Isaiah. He finds a place where it was written <clears throat> uh, that uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, it's talking about the day of the Lord, but he doesn't get to the part of vengeance, right? It's the the part where he's talking about bringing the good news and uh, and God's peace. I'm forgetting what exactly it says, but I think you remember at least somewhat that uh, it's the good part of it, not the wrath. Right? And so Jesus Himself rightly divides the word of truth. In that time, says, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all the people wondered and eventually wanted him out instead of hearing more. Jeremiah 32, verse 40, is the next time it occurred, same story. We went back to Jeremiah 31, 31, chapter and verse being the same. That's why it's the easiest for me to, to go to that one. Where God himself says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And not in the... And, and, and it's actually quoted, you're in Hebrews, if you turn back to chapter 8. That entire passage is quoted word for word in Hebrews chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 10. But I'll actually read verse 8 through 13. So Hebrews 8, 8. It says, For finding fault with them, Israel, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord... For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Again, those verses are a direct quote from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And he ends it with saying, in uh, the writer of Hebrews, I should say, in that he saith a new covenant he had made the first, first hold. Yeah, messed up the old English there. Now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Okay, just simple logic, like we talked about last time. If he's calling something new, the other one must be old. <laughs> so it's going to be done and away with and replaced with this new one. All right, Jeremiah 50, verse 5, again, is talking of the same everlasting covenant. That was an interesting passage because it talked not only of Babylon at that time, but future Babylon, I believe. 
Uh, but we see the, uh, the restoration of Israel in that passage as well. Next, we went to Ezekiel 16. It occurs in verse 60. And Ezekiel 37, occurring in verse 26. I wasn't going to go over all of these again, but I think I want to read in Ezekiel 36. So why don't we turn there? Ezekiel 36, now last time we were together, I went from verse 16 all the way to 36. I just want to focus this time on verse 21 through 20. Oh, we'll see how far we go. Ezekiel 36, 21. God is speaking here and he says, But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. And this is a reference, if you like playing the Bible reference game like I do. Uh, Romans chapter 2, 24 talks about Israel profaning God's name among the heathen. So this is, a, this is where that occurs. Verse 22 says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. Second time he says that. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, third time, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, four, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I put, or will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness uncleannesses. <laughs> and I will call for the corn and will increase it, lay no famine upon you, and so forth. Okay, so I, I wanted to get at least to the part where he says, I'm basically going to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, if you don't mind me using that term. But if he's telling uh, them, Israel at this time, that he's going to put his own spirit in them. Verse 27, cause you to walk in my stats, you shall, 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 <laughs> ye shall keep my judgments. So they're going to do what is right. This type of verbiage is reiterated in uh, Philippians 2. Right? It's God in you. It's the spirit in you. God's will. Ugh, man, I always mess this one up. Hold on. <laughs> it's kind of important to get this right. It is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. So that's God speaking to us Gentiles that are in Christ. Uh, but isn't that kind of the same thing? When we trust in the gospel of his grace, the message of reconciliation, how that God through Christ reconciled the world unto himself, paid for the sin of the world by his blood, we now have his Holy Spirit living in us. And his Holy Spirit is going to guide us into what is right, if we allow it. Right? God does say, don't quench the Spirit in 1 Thessalonians, which implies that we can't. Right? We can still walk in the flesh if we want to, because all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. Right? Not all things are profitable. We spent I don't know how many weeks on that one. So, uh, God's Spirit is in us, that, and He works in us both to will, that is to desire, and to do of His good pleasure. Sin ought to be exceeding sinful to us and repulsive. Okay? So we ought not to do those things, but to desire, sincerely desire to do that which is right. And I don't yeah, you know, no one's perfect. I'm not going to say that. It's, this is a, one of those things that's easier said than done. But the heart should be in that place. Right? That's why I constantly challenge all of us, where's my heart at? Right? I'll say it in that phrase because I need to do that too. <laughs> right? I'm not exempt from any of that. Uh, but where is my heart at in whatever situation? Am I doing this for my own gain, selfishly, in other words? Or am I doing this out of a loving heart? What would, what would Jesus do? <laughs> what happened to that movement? But, uh, you know, but that's, that's kind of the same thought process, though. You know, how would God act in this way, in this situation? All right. 
So I digressed a little bit. But I wanted to get this back in our minds <clears throat> of uh, what the New Testament was for Israel. So the Old Testament was they are blessed for obedience and cursed for disobedience, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 28, I believe, is the chapter that displays all of that. You got 14 verses of blessings and like 50 of cursings. I don't remember exactly how many. It's a lot. So <laughs> it should be very obvious. God says, please do this <laughs> and don't do that stuff, right? And so uh, that was the Old Testament. It was largely works-based. Salvation of the soul, though, was still by faith alone. Everyone okay with that? Habakkuk 2.4 says the just shall live by faith, not by the works of the law. But the faithful one would do exactly what God said, and God said, do the law, right? So everyone that was faithful in Israel would do the works of the law. All right, so that's the everlasting covenant, the new covenant. So then, okay, that's where I want to get to next. So in Hebrews uh, 13, it said that uh, the blood of the new, the everlasting covenant, Right? Jesus' blood paid for the everlasting covenant. Which one could that possibly be referring to? Not the old one, but the new one, right? And last time we talked about how uh, covenants typically were ratified by blood. I don't know why. I don't know anybody that does that today. It's the way it was. So the Old Testament was ratified by blood. We looked at that in um, Exodus 24. That's when they brought the sacrifices uh, and Moses took of the, the blood from those sacrifices. He sprinkled like everything, right? The altar, the book, the people. And he said, this is the blood of the Old Testament. And then the people said, I don't know, two or three times, all that the Lord has said, we will do, <laughs> right? And they broke it within, what, 40 days or less. So that, but that, that was inaugurated then by blood. Then it shouldn't come too much of a surprise then that the New Testament should be inaugurated, ratified by blood. But this is a more excellent sacrifice than the blood of goats and calves. That's what I was trying to get at uh, before. And the writer of Hebrews talks about that too. Jesus Christ is holy, harmless, wait, <laughs> undefiled, separate from sinners. Okay, I can't remember exactly how that verse goes, but you can find it in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> But he, he was a more excellent sacrifice, so that instead of doing it over and over and over again, he did it once and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Hey, it's a paraphrase of quite a bit of Hebrews. Please read it. It's really fascinating stuff. Uh, but the New Testament was ratified by his blood. And then we went back to Matthew 26, which is the hopefully familiar Last Supper uh, with you all, where he says, take this cup, each one of you, and drink of it. This is the blood of the new covenant, right? So that's what he said. Hebrews confirms that this is the blood of the new covenant, but he also says in Hebrews that it's the everlasting covenant. Okay, then. Uh, something just to keep in the back of our minds for now as we talk about some other things. I'm almost up to the point where I said start here. Then I asked us this question. So uh, as Gentiles, before the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul, what did we have? Big fat zero, right? Spiritually speaking, right? E Ephesians 2. Yeah, because I remember wanting to read this entire chapter last time. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, makes that pretty clear. And we know he's, that the Apostle Paul was writing to Gentile saints as well as Jew, I suppose, in, in, according to the first few verses. Uh, verse 1, where it says, To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. But uh, chapter 2, verse 11 says, Wherefore remember that he being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time... Ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So spiritually speaking, the Gentiles had nothing apart from Israel, I suppose, under the law. But now, this is the good news, the great news, of the message of, of reconciliation. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, the Gentile, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, 
And that's that same blood that ratified and inaugurated the New Testament, that everlasting covenant. It says, for he is our peace who hath made both one, and I've been over this before, but I always ask, who is the both here? It'd be Jew and Gentile, right? Israel and Gentile. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition. And if you'd like to ask the question, what's that? Well, verse 15 answers it. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's what he did. That was, that was the thing separating Jew and Gentile, right? They had the oracles of God committed to them. They had the law of God given to Israel. Uh, so they had the works. They had the priesthood. They had it, they had it all, didn't they? Uh, but God uh, took that nailed it to his cross, what Colossians 2 says, taking it out of the way. And here it says, uh, it, it, he abolished it in his flesh, the enmity. Uh, verse 15 ends with, for to make in himself of twain, that's the old way of saying two, one new man, so making peace. And this is the same gesture I do probably every week, where he took Jew and Gentile and brought them together into one body. Okay, That's the message of reconciliation, isn't it? Yes. Okay, praise God for that. But how do we fit into all of this? Uh, did I want to ask that question? You know? This was my biggest problem, is how to logically put this forth <laughs> and, and make sense of it all so we understand what is God's word really saying here. Uh, I would love to go through, actually, chapter 3, verse 11. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, we can do that. Uh, so he said in verse 16 that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, Jew and Gentile, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, the Gentile, and to them that were nigh, the Jew. For through him, Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father, God and God, right? Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now those last few verses remind me of 1 Corinthians 3 when Paul says, I am the master builder and I lay the foundation but let him take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Okay, so just food for thought, I suppose. Uh, chapter 3 says, For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. That means something that's hidden. As I wrote before in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known under the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is it? All right? This is, and I'm establishing these definitions because when we talk about a particular passage uh, that's coming up, people stumble left and right over. Second Corinthians 3. I warned you about it last week. So we'll get there in just a minute. Or 10. So he says, <laughs> which in other ages was not made known, but verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That was what was not made known. Right? Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And again, unsearchable by definition means you cannot search for it. Right? You're not going to find it anywhere before Acts 9 if you go cover to cover. <laughs> I would say Romans through Philemon, but you can see it in the book of Acts as well. Okay? Where was I? Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Again, work together. Our oneness, our unity in Christ as his body, which from the beginning of the world hath been what? Hid, Hid in God. To back up what he said about being unsearchable, or earlier when he said it was not made known, or when he said it was a mystery. Words mean things, <laughs> right? And so I just want to point that out because there's a lot of confusion in the world, spiritually speaking, uh, which is, you know, it's unfortunate. I was blinded for so long, too, so I can definitely empathize, right? Not just sympathize, empathize, one of those two. Um, 
because I was blind to it too. I didn't see it even though it's hidden in plain sight now, isn't it? It's right there, black and white. Um, but that, that's what this mystery is, Jew and Gentile together in one body, enjoying all the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Uh, and, and I pointed out Ezekiel 36 that God already talked about his Holy Spirit living in the believer. Right? That wasn't a mystery. Right? And, and causing the believer to do that which is right. Not that he has to, I suppose, in this life, but when we have the brand new body, it won't be able to sin anymore, which would be awesome, far greater than this. But he mentioned that that was going to happen. And we, we see that today several times in Romans through Philemon. It talks about the Holy Spirit living in us. Now, how did we get that? That's not a right, the right question to ask. Okay, hold that thought. I'll get there too, because Romans 11, hint, hint. I want to finish what's in here, though. Verse 9, uh, we just said that, didn't we? Make all men see what is the fellowship and the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now remember, he, he determined this before the foundation of the world. This is what's going to happen. So God knew all along what was going to happen. He just revealed it throughout history, or we could say dispensationally. It's kind of the same thing. But as history went along, God revealed more and more and more until God filled up full his word through the Apostle Paul. Okay? So it says that Colossians 1.25. It was the dispensation, which we just read about, the fellowship of the mystery, Gentile and Jew together in one body, that fills up full the word of God that now all the spiritual everything knows about it, right? Whether they are for God or against, uh, because it just says the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, that includes both that are still for God and those that are against, because not all the spiritual wickedness has been thrown in the lake of fire yet. That's future. Everybody okay so far? All right. <laughs> Let me know if there's any confusion or questions, because like I said, this, is, this was hard for me to piece all together logically, but it is there. All right, so we see we are now part of the spiritual blessings along with the Jew. We no longer need to keep the works of the law because Christ did. He fulfilled it by uh, his life and shedding his blood. So he nailed that to the cross, inaugurated the New Testament, and we Gentiles, through his blood, uh, get to partake in all the spiritual blessings. Okay? Now we'll go back to Romans 15. I think this is where we ended last week. Romans 15 and verse 23, uh, Paul begins to, to say to the Romans, or the church that's in Rome, that he is desiring to visit them in person. And he's finally just about to be on his way. It says, but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them in Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And that's when I asked the question, or, the, or said something about it. it, says a lot in that one verse, it's really easy to gloss over. Okay? First off, let's think about the timing of this passage and what's been going on. So back in Acts 2 through 5 or so, we read several times how the apostles, Peter the Twelve, uh, and all the, the believers in, of Israel at that time uh, pooled all their belongings together, right? And they divvied out so that no man lacked anything. And so they basically sold off all that they had. A lot of them sold their land. You got the uh, account of Ananias and Sapphira where they tried to keep back some of the money for themselves uh, and ended up dying for it. But that was the idea. They sold off all their goods, all their stuff, so that they could communally have whatever they needed. Why? Because Jesus told them they're about to be going into the tribulation period, and they're not, they're, they're not going to need their stuff, 
right? And he even told them in during, uh, I think, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that uh, you know, to the rich young ruler, for example, sell off all that you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me. Right? It, it was a parting of the earthly things. And uh, the reason for that, too, is they would be supernaturally cared for during that tribulation period. That's a whole other can of worms. We'll talk about that if, maybe, when we study the book of Revelation. Okay? So they would be taken care of, but that's why they're now poor, right? Because they sold off all that stuff, and now if we, I think last time we read through 2 Peter 3, or maybe a couple weeks ago, where Peter even says this uh, gap in time between us going into our kingdom that God promised us, Israel, where the 12 apostles would sit on the 12 thrones uh, of you know, ruling and reigning over Israel, it's because of salvation that God gave through Paul. So that's essentially a paraphrase of 2 Peter 3. <laughs> okay? So that, that's what was going on, and now here they are, kind of stuck without stuff, and all these Gentiles now are so excited to give of their bounty to them. Does that make sense with everybody? Okay? And so in verse 27, when it says, it has pleased them verily or truly, and their debtors they are, for if, that's the Greek word I or EI, meaning factual if, so this is true or since, since the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. Who's the they here? It's, it's the Jews, right? Because the Jews had it all, like I said before. Uh, God was working through Israel, and that's not to say Gentiles were just, you know, too bad, so sad, you're going to hell. Uh, they could proselytize to Israel. They could still be justified by faith. But then the faithful Jew, or, sorry, Gentile would follow the works of the law. Okay? They'd bring the appropriate sacrifices to the priests. They were never allowed in uh, or to go into the, the priesthood, of course. But they still could partake. God says in several different verses to treat the stranger that sojourns among you as one of your own. Okay? I paraphrase a lot <laughs> uh, because I know not everybody uses the old English, but you can see these things in your Bibles. If you want to challenge me, though, I'm, I'm all open ears about that. So anyway, it says, uh, chapter, or sorry, verse 27, that we Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. When did that happen? Was it not when Jesus shed his blood? We just didn't know it until it was revealed to Paul. Right? Okay. <laughs> What am I getting at with all of this? Well, this, I guess, suppose, I suppose leads us to Romans 11. Since we're in Romans 15, if you just back up a little bit to Romans 11, we went verse by verse over this. Boy, when was that? Two months ago? <clears throat> Seems like a long time. Oh, uh, boy, where do I start? Verse 13. Again, one of these verses that should not be glossed over easily. <laughs> When Paul himself says, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Not himself, never himself. He always put himself beneath, he said he was the less than the least of all saints. But the office, he was commissioned particularly to go to the Gentiles, and that's very different than what Peter and the Twelve were doing. And I'll just bring this up if anyone wants to question, we can look at it. But in Acts 10, Peter says explicitly to Cornelius, who's a Gentile, you know that it is not lawful for me, who am a Jew, to come unto one of another nation. But God told me, so here I am, what do you want? <laughs> right, so that, I know, I paraphrase Peter. But that's essentially what it was. He said, I am not supposed to be here, you know, by law, but I'm here because God told me to come. So up until that point, where were Peter and the Twelve and the deacons, Philip, you know, going through all it? Where were they, where were they, who were they preaching to? Israel. It was Israel. It was all Israel all the time, uh, even though Paul was, or Saul, I should say at that time, was saved on the road to Damascus. He trusted that Jesus is Lord now, so he had the faith. But Jesus even told him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. That was different. Okay? And, and Peter ag agrees with all of this in 2 Peter, also in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. Where did the time go? Um, it's an hour ahead. Maybe five extra minutes. It's an hour ahead. Yeah, we still got an extra hour. Well, I got five minutes to go through, like, okay, we probably won't need the projector next week, but bring it. Anyway. Man, oh man. <clears throat> all right, Romans 11, quick. <laughs> So he is the apostle of the Gentiles. Um, let's see. Casting away of them being the reconciling of the world. Verse 15. Just imagine when all Israel is saved. 
how glorious that's going to be when God makes everything brand new. Okay? Uh, verse 17, is some of the branches be broken off, thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and of, with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Uh, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. And again, we talked about what is this. This is that the same kind of idea, the Gentiles being brought into the spiritual blessings of Israel. Right? We have all those spiritual blessings, blessings, I guess, if you want to put those words together. But we have it all with the Jew. There's no difference in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or what you will do. If you trust in what he's done for you, his blood paid for your sin, you're in Christ. It's a done deal. You're having all the spiritual blessings no matter what you do. Although there is profit to living godly. So please do that. Uh, but he, he goes on to say, um, verse 20 or verse 19, thou wilt say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, good, correct, that's true. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. Because they cho chose not to believe they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Okay? So if you choose not to believe this, guess what's going to happen to you? <laughs> right? So he's just reminding us not to get high-minded, not allow that flesh to take over. Verse 21, God spared not, if God spared not the natural branches, take, take heed lest he also not spare... Oh boy, I can't do this quick, can I? <laughs> take heed lest he also spare not thee. The whole point is, verse 25, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there is always going to be only a remnant of believing Israel until God is done pouring out his wrath upon them. Hey, and God promised through Daniel there's 70 weeks. I don't have time to go into all of this, but there's one period of seven years coming still. hasn't happened yet. And once that's all said and done, all Israel, in my mind, shall be saved. Because that's when, in uh, Revelation 20, it says this is the first resurrection. Hey, so they will rule and reign like they should. Uh, those that survive the tribulation and still continue in unbelief and multiply during the thousand-year reign uh, Satan is going to gather all of them against Jerusalem, against Jesus, because it didn't work the first time, so let's try it again. I don't understand, but that's what Satan's going to do, and Jesus is going to destroy them all, sit on that great white throne, and then pour out judgment, right? And they'll be cast in the lake of fire one after the other because they did not line up to truth, his word. Okay, I didn't know I was going to go there, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said I cannot keep all of this stuff straight in my head the whole point is I wanted to define what is Old Testament what is the New Testament what is the mystery what was prophesied before what was hid in Christ until Paul okay? what do we have what do the Jews have are we living in you know, what are we living under I guess you could say that. And that most would say we are under grace not under law true yes uh, but that's, is that Old Testament, is that New Testament, or is it something completely separate? Uh, or is it the New Testament, but we've been grafted into all the spiritual blessings? Which is where I would say yes, because that's what I read. And if anyone has something else to say, that's totally fine. But this is, I've struggled with this for so long, I really wanted to read 2 Corinthians 3. we got two minutes, let's just read through it. At least to start thinking about it for next week. I had other verses to go through. We just don't have time. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse one. <clears throat> it says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And Paul was constantly having to defend his apostleship. And here's another passage about that. Do we have to commend ourselves? Are you not proof that we were sent by God with this message? Because you believed it and you're living it? Right, So that's kind of the idea of what's going on here. Verse 4 says, Such trust have we through Christ to God work, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of our, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, 
not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And verse 6 has been a stumbling block for many. And I'm not going to do a poll of who's been messed up by this verse. I'll just raise my hand. I have. I've been trying to figure out how does this fit? What New Testament is he talking about? Even if you go to the original Greek, it is the exact same phrase as in Luke 22 when Jesus says, this is the New Testament in my blood. So you, there's no apparent difference to that. So then how does Paul and well, this Sosthenes or is this Timothy? Paul and Timothy, how are they able ministers of the New Testament? Well, it describes exactly what that New Testament is. I got 35 seconds. Here we go. Uh, it's not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So there's a differentiation right there. What was the ministration of the letter? It's the law, right? What's the ministration of the Spirit? What? <laughs> there's a lot of answers there. See? This one's hard to, to go with. Uh, but how many covenants were there? Just two, right? Old and new? So if we've got the ministration of the letter being the law, the ministration of spirit, remember what we read in Ezekiel 36? Yeah. I will put my spirit in you, right, to Israel. Isn't that the same thing? Well, if we didn't get it from that, verse 7 says, if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, law, right, because that was written by the finger of God on Mount Sinai, Moses went, uh, received the two tables of stones, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, he was so shiny for spending time with God that they couldn't look at him. They put a veil on. Uh, but that glory was to be done away. Remember, that which is old is ready to, to, to fade away, or however it was in Hebrews 8.13. Verse 8 says, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation... See all these different names, but it's the same thing. Uh, it's the ministration of the letter of death and condemnation. That's all about law. What does the law do? Points out sin. Right? Romans 3.20. That's what it does. But that law was holy and just and good. Right, Romans 7. And here it says, too, that it was glorious. And if it be glorious, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now, what's that talking about? Well, it's going back to verse 6, the Spirit, the ministration of the Spirit. Okay? Hopefully you're starting to see how these things fit together. I do want to go verse by verse through this passage all the way through the end of verse, uh, chapter 5. So I didn't plan on going through all of this with the Everlasting Covenant stuff, but it is what it is. <laughs> I think it's important to read all of this in its context and understand what it's saying uh, to help bring peace of mind. Because right? uh, I know some people have tried to jump through hoops to explain, well, they're able ministers of the New Testament because that was exact only for Israel and for Judah. So they can tell it to any Jew that they want to, but they're going to tell you the message of reconciliation which is completely separate from all of that. Like, well, okay. But it, this is where, you know, that's where I had a struggle. Are the body of Christ and Israel, are they always completely separated? And I can't see it that way because God said the earth was made to be inhabited. And some people will say, well, the body of Christ is going to inherit these earthly seats of administration, or I'm sorry, heavenly seats of administration, and that's where we're going to be for all eternity while Israel's on earth. Really? Because God never once said the heavens were meant to be inhabited. So I had a hard time believing in that. Uh, so all those things led me to a whole bunch of stuff here to talk about next week, which I thought I'd finish this week. Silly me. <laughs> Any thoughts, questions, comments so far? <laughs> Before, yeah, it's probably enough to think about, isn't it? Let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you for your holy word. I am thankful that your word is true, uh, no matter how much we may struggle uh, to understand. But I'm so thankful, God, that you have given us the mind of Christ, you've given us your Holy Spirit, that we can discern spiritual things. So may you guide us into that truth every day as we study and zealously seek you out. Uh, just like your word says, that once we are in Christ, that we become that peculiar people zealous of good works. So may you continue to work through us every day. Uh, we look forward to next week. I uh, pray we may get together. Uh, or, of course, that glorious day that you just call us home to heaven to live in paradise with you. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you for this time, and may you uh, be honored and glorified always through us. In Christ's name, amen.